Next item is private members' business on the order paper, and that's a motion on children with hearing difficulties and deafness. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That this assembly recognises the importance of early detection, intervention, and support for children with hearing difficulties and deafness, acknowledges the negative delay, the negative impact that delay can have on their future educational attainment, and calls on the Minister of Health to take immediate steps to identify and address urgently the backlog of postponed audio appointments and cancelled cochlear implant procedures that have arisen as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. Okay, thank you. I guess now she am sorry, Catherine Kelly, Nation Ruin, Akorham Tosse. I now call Catherine Kelly to move the motion. Eight to move. Thank you. Uh, the Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer for the motion will have 10 minutes uh, to propose and 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Uh, please open the debate on the motion. Thank you. Romeo Goodless, Ken Corlea, and good afternoon, everyone. As we have just come through International Week of the Deaf, I thought I would attempt some sign language in support of children, young people and adults who may be watching the debate. Recently, the Minister for Communities has committed to bringing forward to the Assembly sign language legislation once co-design and co-production work has completed. She has informed me by written answer that the legislation will be built on the principles of equality and social inclusion and ensuring that the deaf and hard of hearing community have the same rights and opportunities as those in the hearing community and they are able to access services in their own language. Hearing is one of the most important senses we have. The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic has seen the number of people waiting for diagnostic testing soar. The latest figures published by the Department of Health's Information and Analysis Directorate in June reveal an almost 150,000 long waiting list for diagnostic tests. Faced with such a backlog and knowing that for many people these are life-saving tests, it is easy to see why almost 8,000 people waiting for hearing tests might not be at the top of anyone's list. But I want to argue that they should be. Diagnostic tests to identify hearing impairments may not be life-saving, but they are profoundly life-affirming. And for children, and for young children, late diagnosis and delayed intervention is likely to have a lifelong adverse impact. The evidence is clear. Early detection and intervention leads to better outcomes in terms of language acquisition, whether spoken or sign, young children's emotional and cognitive development, and closes any educational attainment gap between hearing and non-hearing pupils. Late diagnosis amongst the young can result in a level of disadvantage they may carry for the rest of their lives, leading to poor educational outcomes, worse employment opportunities, more ill health, and including mental ill health. Right now, the new school day could prove detrimental to the education of young children not yet diagnosed. The need to juggle learning and follow new school safety measures is very worrying in an already stressful situation. As it is now imperative that we wear face coverings as we go about our daily lives, this in itself is another added barrier to children and adults awaiting a diagnostic test. Where once they may have been reliant on lip reading to engage in conversation, now they are unable to. This new added barrier and complication must be taken into consideration to alleviate the anxiety that this must cause. It is now vital that the Department of Health and the Department of Education work together, as required by the Children's Services Cooperation Act, to urgently oversee development of an action plan to address any backlog of children with delayed diagnosis of deafness. It's essential that parents and children have a role in building this plan. This invisible condition requires regular screening to ensure the problem is detected sooner and in the hope of a better outcome. Therefore, it is of prime importance that the Department of Health ensures continued vigilance regarding children's hearing. Diagnostic testing or the fitting or adjusting of aids cannot be carried out remotely. I would like to mention some real life experiences of children and their parents during the past seven months. Parents not being able to reach trust support services when hearing aids break, 
parents and carers having to pay for microsuction for their child when appoint appointments are cancelled. A parent recently from the Western Trust area informed the National Deaf Children's Society about having contacted audiology as her son's moulds did not fit. They were able to send out new moulds, adapted from the previous pattern, which worked out very well. However, the lady knew other children who were not so lucky. One child had loose vents causing infection, and the only action taken was to prescribe antibiotics unseen, which led to recurring infections because the problem with the vents was not addressed. These are only some of the issues which have been highlighted by parents and carers with the National Deaf Children's Society. Remote audiology does not work for children who have hearing difficulties or who are deaf. It has serious implications on the early intervention that is needed. I believe that currently there is no framework for paediatric audiology in the North. From what I have read, in 2018, the Regional Audiology Forum agreed that it would develop a set of, of quality standards for paediatric audiology services to be applicable from birth to 18 years. Department of Health were then to sign off on it. Will the Minister take this forward in light of the increasingly lengthy waiting lists? It could go some way in ensuring measurable and continuous improvements of services whilst improving access for our children and young people. In supporting this motion, members will be adding their voices to calls to the Minister of Health to take a moment amongst the clamour of tackling the impact of COVID-19 and help around 8,000 people, young and not so young, to get their hearing tests and take action to address postponed cochlear implant surgery. We need seamless access to hearing health services without interruption or restrictions. I call upon the Assembly to support this mo motion. Thank you. Call Pam Cameron. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I first of all just thank the members opposite for bringing this very important issue to the fore and for securing this motion today. If we were to make a list of impacts of COVID-19, we would be here well into the night. But when it comes to prioritising and rectifying those impacts, difficult decisions have to be made. Certainly within our health service, faced with such wide-ranging disruptions, it's not an easy task. Last week, the executive announced the intention to redress the crisis in cancer care, and that is right. It is life or death, and I very much welcome that focus. But we, we must also recognise the quality of life impacts too, the life opportunities impacted upon, and that's why I believe today's motion is so important. Across Northern Ireland today, there, there will be parents sick with, with anxiety about health and welfare of their children who need intervention to address deafness. As each day goes by, the despair grows greater for some. We simply cannot allow this to continue. For the health, education and employment outcomes of those affected by deafness, we must focus on getting appointments back and meeting that need. The figures show that education outcomes are not as high for children who are deaf. None of us should accept that. Rather, we should be asking why. And then setting about addressing that inequality. The reality is that early intervention is proven to help deal with this imbalance. That is why this motion and the call to action is so important. We need audiology appointments ramped up, Mr Deputy Speaker. We need the testing back on track and we need our health service at large to get back to face-to-face -face appointments where virtual simply does not work in this case. We also need to be aware of the new challenges of our deaf community face. The prevalence of face masks in society now poses a real challenge in communication with those who lip read. I commend my colleague, the Education Minister, for factoring this into his decision making around masks in schools. Society at large needs to take a similar cognizance. Mr Deputy Speaker, like so many areas of the health service, we need a speedy return to service in this particular field. Early intervention is proven to help these children and young people. We need to make sure that intervention is indeed early and that intervention allows that potential to be fulfilled socially, educationally and in terms of employment. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, we support the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and my thanks to the proposers of this motion today, and I rise to support the motion before us. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, here we are six months later, and coronavirus has altered just about every facet of our daily lives. We have all had to evolve and adapt and change the way we go about our lives in order to flatten the curve and to save lives. We have all had to make sacrifices. But what are those who have, had to have additional health needs and how have they had to adapt in the current crisis? I'm speaking today specifically uh, of the case of children with hearing difficulties, deafness and the implications of coronavirus on early detection, on intervention and about support for them. Over the last six months, we have seen appointments having to be postponed or at worst cancelled altogether uh, for those early detection and intervention appointments. Most of the cochlear implant surgery has been cancelled altogether and there are now more delays in the diagnosis of children with hearing difficulties. Mr Deputy Speaker, we all know that language issues can be particularly contentious here in the North, but we can all at least agree that language development for our, our children is key and critical. For children with hearing difficulties, it is even more important. I welcome that newborn screening is considered as a red flag and has been taking place throughout in the past six months. However, the overall consequence of coronavirus has been that a number of people will have missed appointments during these last months and had them cancelled or not been able to access them at all. There will be people who have fallen through the cracks and it is essential that we identify who they are so that we can remedy this. This could involve carrying out the necessary screening for children who were not born in a hospital uh, to have diagnostics done and have fitting and adjusting of hearing aids carried out in remote or in safe clinical settings. Effectively, what we could do is we could use the local community care setting where these procedures could be carried out. Mr Deputy Speaker, while we are here today to bring this motion to the attention of our Health Minister, as seems to be so often the case this, this weather, um, these are, uh, there are elements of this motion that I believe are of particular importance to other Executive Ministers, and I have no doubt that the Health Minister will relay these on to those Ministers. In these days of remote and virtual experiences, this will be more important than ever. For instance, we are seeing steps uh, forward through the Health and Social Care Board for video relay service that allow those with hearing difficulties to make telephone calls through British Sign Language or the Irish Sign Language to our health services. That's an important step forward. However, we know those in England and Scotland have had access to this for some time, so it is good that we are finally catching up. But at present, this service is strictly limited to health services uh, and it has only been in place from May, so it would be good to see that, that developing. Uh, this is something for our communities minister maybe to give consideration to, to how those with deafness or hearing difficulties to make phone calls uh, to the VRS for the benefits office. And the education minister could consider how they could make telephone calls to the education authority uh, for their children's school. I, I know that's more for adults, but uh, there are lots of different ways that we could be intervening to help. I welcome news that the Infrastructure Minister, uh, Nicola Malone, has approved a new dynamic PPE purchasing system which services the entire public service and includes transparent face coverings on the list, uh, which is something that people have asked for as well. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, the time of coronavirus has also opened up a shift to home working and those with hearing difficulty need to be supported as much as possible through this. Uh, that could be some, one of the impacts of coronavirus, which our new head of civil service, whomever and whenever they are appointed, could be taken on board when, when they are appointed. The most important thing, Mr Speaker, is that those in our community with deafness or hearing loss need to feel that their dignity is acknowledged and that we as legislators uh, smooth the way as much as possible and remove every obstacle that we can to allow them to live their lives as fully as possible. This begins a childhood with early detection, early intervention and early support. And I support the motion. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I welcome this motion uh, being brought to the House today to enable us to register our acknowledgement of the importance of early detection, intervention and support for children with hearing difficulties or deafness. As the motion points out, there can be a negative impact on a child's education 
presented by deafness or hearing difficulties. The various delays that the motion identify are hugely regrettable, but like many aspects of our health provision, we need look no further than the impact of COVID-19 to understand the problems this gives our health service in trying to cope with waiting lists right across the spectrum of medical conditions. There are no easy solutions nor magic wand cures for the reality of the disruption COVID is causing to many aspects of our life, especially in connection with routine and planned medical care. It is reassuring as seen in a, a personal family situation recently that newborn babies are still receiving all the tests that newborn babies normally receive, and these include audiology tests that can pick up hearing problems at a very early stage. This early detection is vital. Hearing is one of the most important faculties we have. Living in a silent world cannot be a pleasant place to be. Many of us may have seen the videos circulating on social media of young children and babies being fitted with advanced technology hearing aids that take them out of a previous silent world. The amazement and the sheer delight on the faces of these children would touch the coldest heart when their mothers speak to them for the first occasion in which they can actually hear their voice. I'm confident that the Minister will support this motion and will be taking every step open to him to address the delays in appointments. It will not be an easy road for him to travel as he grapples with delays across all the medical disciplines. It must be acknowledged that he inherited a health service that was operating on the pure goodwill of everyone employed in it. Nurses were forced to stand on picket lines in the middle of winter to highlight their issues. Morale throughout the system was low and waiting lists were at an all-time high. None of those issues could be nailed to Minister Swan's door. And he did give a pledge when he came into the office to address all outstanding issues as quickly as he could. COVID-19 put paid to the fullness of those plans. If progress is to be made, it will require the cooperation of everyone in this House, and not least his executive colleagues. We must accept that it will be a case of baby steps as we go forward into a winter that may bring more major disruption to all health services. Hopefully, aspirations such as expressed in this motion can be progressed. The public have a role to play, and those in this House also have a role to play, and have an obligation to provide leadership as our public health services try to reduce the transmission of the coronavirus. If a major and disruptive second wave can be avoided, it will be because of the continued and admirable adherence to guidance and advice by the public. To those who would demonstrate outside this building and speak about this pandemic as being some sort of hoax or overreaction of government and who point to the reduction of medical interventions across the board, I would say, wise up, and I know I've stolen those words from previous speakers. Follow the guidance and help speed up the return to normal service that we all crave for, especially in the field of children's health. My party fully supports this motion, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Call Paula Bradshaw. Um, Deputy Speaker, I rise, of course, to support the motion. Children with learning difficulties are, of course, all different, but one thing which unites them is a desire to live as independent a life as possible. They want to be able to, just like everyone else, to influence the world around them and develop healthy and stable relationships. Sometimes it can be the smallest detection or intervention which enables this. This will, of course, usually mean interventions which affect the whole family particularly when they have been born to hearing, hearing parents. Empowering parents to make informed choices, for example, on treatment or communication options, is one of these small but vital interventions which is necessary early on. Another, as we have heard, are the relatively minor implant procedures which can have such a major impact. Still another are the audio appointments referenced in the motion which enable those informed choices to be most effectively made. This is, of course, about future educational attainment, as the motion says, but it is also about so much more than that. One area of particular concern to me is the impact the absence of some of these small detections or interventions will have on mental health immediately and in the future. 
Data on this area is not good, but it is estimated that 40% of children with hearing difficulties develop mental health problems, nearly double the incidence in the general population. The main reason for this research suggests is communication deprivation. This is exactly why, as the motion states, audio appointments and implant procedures are so important. These delays are adding significantly to overall stress and strain and ultimately to the prospects of falling behind peers and subsequent poor mental ill health. The four-tier spectrum of mental health provision from early advice at primary level through specialist assessments and services, then multidisciplinary teams and finally specialist outpatient or inpatient units is established and vital for all children and therefore even more so for the children with hearing difficulty. If even tier one is not happening, the impact can be long lasting. This means that child and adolescent mental health services specialised for children with hearing difficulties had never been more important before the pandemic and the pandemic makes them even more so. The particular issue, it seems to me, is that if the early interventions do not occur and the referrals to specialist services, be they directly to do with hearing or even in areas such as counselling, therefore do not happen, the impact can be long lasting. Again, a small intervention missed means a significant um, problem can develop. In broad terms, this is the concern when we hear lines like urgent procedures are being prioritised. A minor implant may not seem like an urgent procedure. An early assessment of communication may not seem like an urgent procedure. An audio appointment of outcome of which will help the family unit make empowered decisions may not seem like an urgent procedure. But any of these steps taken now may well avoid the need for urgent procedures later. They will also enhance a child's sense that they can influence the world around them and live as independently as possible with all the positive effects that ha it has on their mental well-being and that of those around them. So in closing, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I just would like to place on record my appreciation of the work of the audiology staff and the speech and language therapists who are trying their best in an environment of COVID staff vacancies and these waiting lists we've discussed today. I look forward to hearing from the Minister what steps will be taken urgently to ensure that children with learning dif um, difficulties do not miss out on basic interventions and procedures which would ensure that they do not suffer from communication deprivation with the inevitable consequence on um, health and, sorry, mental health and also education. Thank you. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the motion as well. Communication is fundamental to the development of every child. Learning good communication skills early in life is key to positive relationships with family and friends, for good mental health and happiness, and to educational and employment opportunities in the future. It is particularly key for those children who are deaf or have hearing impairments. Early detection, intervention, and support for children with hearing difficulties has been shown to improve their mental health and avoid behavioural problems known to develop in those children who do not receive adequate help. A lack of support to communicate can also result in poor cognitive development and negatively impact upon the relationship between the child and their parent. The backlog of postponed and cancelled appointments due to COVID-19 therefore has the potential to have a knock-on effect to both the short and long term for children with hearing difficulties. That is why this issue must be urgently addressed and I welcome the opportunity to discuss this matter today. Before the pandemic, the health service was already experiencing some issues with paediatric audiology services. When an assessment was carried out just last year, it became clear that some health trusts were struggling to meet the standards of access to the services, including on waiting times that they have been set. The South Eastern Trust, for example, which covers the constituency that I represent, scored just 58% towards the service accessibility target, and the report highlighted the need to improve waiting times at this point. Recent figures have shown that this situation is likely to get worse rather than better. ENT has shown one of the largest increase on its waiting list of any speciality between August of 2019 and this year. With shops, calves and restaurants yet to open for business properly, it is time that the health service starts to follow suit, particularly in this case where early detection and intervention are crucial to ensure the best care plan and outcomes for these children. On cochlear implants, this early detection and intervention is especially important. Research has shown that children with implants inserted before they are six months old possess a vocabulary and power of better than that of their hearing peers by the age of five.
Conversely, when an implant is inserted later than this, the equivalent with their hearing peers is lost. Naturally, this can have a significant impact upon a child's first experience at school. Their learning outcomes and the development of their social skills. It's therefore vital that these procedures go ahead as soon as it's safe to do so, and I would encourage the Minister to look at this issue with urgency. Most parents of deaf children have no experience with deafness. An early diagnosis allows parents to make informed choices about treatment plans. It allows parents to educate themselves on how they can best learn to communicate with their child, how they can support their child to learn the social skills that they will need when they enter school, and how they can expand their child's vocabulary. The disadvantage deaf and hearing impaired children face in education already is obvious. Only one needs to look at the statistics. Only half of deaf children make the expected progress in maths and English at key, at key stage two, compared to over 90% of their hearing peers. Just over one third of deaf children obtain five GCSEs compared to nearly 70% of their hearing peers. While just over 1.5 of all 16 to 30 year olds have a form of hearing loss, less than 0.4 of those in higher education declare having such a condition. Evidence has shown the gap widening in recent years and not improving. Whilst all children have lost out in vital schooling due to the pandemic, Mr Deputy Speaker, it will have an even greater impact upon deaf and imp hearing impaired children. And my worry is that the gap will only continue to grow. There are around about 1,500 deaf children in Northern Ireland, and 90% are born to hearing parents, many of whom struggle to communicate with their child and will not be able to educate them adequately at home without support. Speech therapy sometimes is available through school, has also been missed. Staff members and classroom assistants that help these children on a day-to-day -day basis at school have not been able to do so. COVID-19 has already seriously impacted the learning of these children, who are often left behind. The least we can do, Mr Deputy Speaker, is ensure that those who have access to health care that they need to help them. For deaf and hearing impaired children, the pandemic causes ongoing problems. Face masks causes issues for those that rely on lip reading and facial expressions to communicate in their schools. The restrictions due to COVID-19 have created an isolating and lonely time for many. For a child with hearing difficulties starting a new school... I ask the member to draw his remarks to a close, please. Yeah. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, given the ongoing challenges these children are going to face in the oncoming months, it's only right that we do everything that we can, and I would call on the Minister of Health to urgently address the backlog of appointments and surgical procedures. Thank you. I can now hear him, Sir Colm Gildenew, on Cancha. I call Colm Gildenew. Um, and I just would like to welcome the, the, the tone and the interest in relation to this uh, subject here today in the Assembly. And I would welcome any reassurance that the Minister can give the Assembly that the deaf community and wider public that any backlog in diagnostic audio testing, which is fundamental in gaining access to interventions such as sign, cochlear implants or other social or medical support, will be identified and addressed as quickly as possible. For young people, the earlier the intervention, the better the outcome, and I think that's widely recognised across education, health, uh, community, all, all sorts of areas. The earlier we can get in there, the more impact and the more difference can be made. There is evidence that shows that many children with hearing impairments do less well in education than their hearing peers. This isn't inevitable. It's something that we can and we should try to do something about. And I recognise that the Minister has, uh, uh, in, in committee and in other places, flagged up his interest in dealing with health inequalities. And I also recognise that COVID-19 has certainly impacted on our ability to deal with health inequalities in a way that may, we maybe would have liked. But I suppose what, what I would be asking in relation to this is that we try to guard against people slipping further back, as Alex has mentioned earlier, and that we try to protect those who are more, more vulnerable at this time. The development of language and communication skills are vital to children. And during my training as a social worker, we, we had the benefit of a, a kind of a sensory impairment training. And I, I think I had started out from a point of view of believing that uh, deaf and, and hearing difficulties were an absence of sound, but actually they can also be confused sounds, intermittent sounds, and which are very disorientating. And, and I think could easily, as has been mentioned previously, have an impact on, on mental health. So that's a concern as well. Studies show that early access to language, whether through sign or interventions that improve hearing, allows a child to develop an understanding of how language works. 
This means that they are hearing or reading ready when they begin school and are able to map their understanding of how language works onto the written page. If we give children, any child, the right tools and support, they will close the gap between non-hearing and hearing pupils and as a consequence improve their own future economic chances. Improving economic prospects lifts more people out of poverty. And it is, and we have mentioned in this assembly before, inequality harms the individual, obviously and, and primarily, but also it harms our community and it, it also harms our economy in terms of, of developing that. So it's, it's something that is useful and relevant right across the, the sphere. Poverty is a costly alternative to early intervention, both in terms of life changes, future health profile and the public health. And I'm aware that there has been significant research evidence in, in the United States and elsewhere that for every pound you invest in, in early years, you can, over the course of a lifetime, save potentially up to 17 pounds. So that is a really crucial area for intervention. I do note that the National Deaf Children's Society have noted their disappointment in relation to a lack of uh, detail in the Trust's Phase 2 plans around audiology and, uh, audiology and uh, implant services. They, they have identified there there's a lack of detail in respect of that. This motion rightly focuses on the urgent need for early diagnosis for the young. But I'm sure, uh, John Corley, you, you won't mind me mentioning that it's also important that older people get access to timely audio diagnosis as well. Just last week, we debated a motion on dementia, and the Assembly was supportive around the need to develop dementia-friendly communities. But there is growing evidence to show that late diagnosis and intervention for older people experiencing loss of hearing can be a factor in the onset of dementia. I, I, I hope and I know the Minister will keep that in mind also, so I just would like to welcome the, the, uh, the support from all sides of the House in relation to this matter and urge everyone to support the motion. Mr Deputy Speaker, I too wish to rise to support this motion and put my name on the record as doing so, along with my colleague Colin McGrath. Um, the, the motion rightly refers to the, what the negative impact a delay can have on that child, and it refers to their educational attainment, but I would like to go further. Any delay on a child during those formative years really does have the power to create a downward spiral that can very, very quickly lose control. The child, in trying to keep up with their peers and those around them, can move into what is a very lonely place. They may not know or fully understand that they do have a hearing impairment, and the family and the parents around them or caregivers will be in deep distress to know that they have their child on the right track to find the tools to equip them to deal with, with the deafness or the hearing loss that they may be living with. That can follow on when that confidence is knocked that can follow on in the classroom setting or in a formal uh, caregiving setting as a child then starting to present with what is noted as disruptive behaviour. And, and it is a very, very unfortunate and unfair track to put such a young child to such a disadvantage at such an early stage in their life. I would then look at, when we look at a delay in action, versus the action itself. It is not all doom and gloom. There is much to be said for the positive outcome that can come into play whenever a child is supported and identified through that early intervention and seeking help. They can empower themselves with many of the tools, and I do uh, set apart here uh, for mention the audiologists who support these children during difficult times and give them all the tools that they need to make their way through life. I also acknowledge um, that the Minister did, in May, introduce the VRS system within the health service. And I have to say, um, many of us will know that the deaf community in Northern Ireland were very appreciative of that. However, it was six years late. Um, and we won't go there in terms of why that was the case. But I also acknowledge uh, and I reference comments made by my colleague Colin McGrath in terms of every minister at the table has a role to play in supporting the deaf community here in Northern Ireland. 
On the 27th of August, I wrote to the Minister for Communities seeking an assurance that she would look into the VRS system that is being used elsewhere that is VRS for all, and it does allow for those calls to be made to all, this, all the public bodies and beyond private sector bodies to support the deaf community, because it is a very sad reflection of our times when the deaf community are lobbying members of this House to say that they feel left out. And a large bulk of that was not to do with COVID. But I appreciate that the task put in front of the Minister is very much in catching up uh, post-COVID on where we need to be. And I recognise that the Minister will have a, a great amount of pressure on him that he will have to prioritise what piece of work comes first. But I would, would urge him, based on the fact that these are young children during very, very influential formative years, I would urge him to bring this to the top of his, of his work priorities. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Call Robbie Butler. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the author of the motion for bringing the motion today, and I, along with the party, will be supporting it. I also welcome the tone of the debate um, so far with regard to it. Um, uh, when I was on the Health Committee, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the National uh, Deaf Children's Society was one of those organisations who lobbied heavily uh, and brought to the fore very much something that uh, many of us um, would be ignorant to, and that is the pressures faced by the deaf and hard of hearing community um, with regard to access to just about everything. And I know that many members have touched on some of those difficulties, but those are the very things that we need to bear in mind when we speak of the motion, because the motion does point directly to that early, identif uh, early diagnosis, identification, and then that much needed support um, for not just the children, uh, but perhaps crucially, the families. Because one of the things that I learned um, previously was uh, that children who are diagnosed as deaf or hard of hearing, in 90% of occasions they come from a family where there are no hearing difficulties. So those families don't come equipped with the skills, uh, the, the, the knowledge and uh, the resources to deal with the challenges that is faced by, by those young people. Um, and you'll know the Minister has made a, a very early commitment, even during COVID, to make mental health and wellbeing a significant priority of his. And when you look at the, uh, the impact on those with uh, a hearing difficulty or who are deaf, they're four times more likely uh, to suffer from poor mental health, uh, anxiety, and indeed loneliness, specifically. Uh, and I know uh, Sinead Bradley will, will, will testify to this, um, that it is one of those uh, societal uh, hurts that we're facing, and it's one of those pressures, and the deaf community in particular um, will understand what that means. Because that isolation isn't just in terms of that family or in terms of work, but it's, it's a, it's a societally-wide felt issue. Um, the pressures in education have been, have been well addressed, but also there are barriers um, if we don't address these issues early on with regards to uh, employment prospects. And there should be no barrier to anybody to, to do what they want to do if we can get the help in uh, early enough. And we need to give these young people uh, as, as much of a vision and aspiration as, as, as we, we can. Uh, I think it was Colin McGrath, uh, earlier on, he, he talked about the need for cross-departmental work. And, and I think on this, it's absolutely evident, and I don't think anybody uh, will, will say that that's not the case. Uh, he picked out the need, for instance, uh, within communities and the access to benefits, for instance, that there's, there's no barrier. It's as easy. Uh, he, he even gives some work, I think, or some credit to his own minister with regard to infrastructure and transport. But these things should not be seen as barriers and until you speak to some of the, the advocates for children or for adults with uh, learning, uh, hearing difficulties and deafness, sometimes it just goes, uh, it's missed. So I just want to pay tribute to those that work in that department, whether it's in uh, health, whether it's in the trusts, to provide that help and assistance to those in the community and voluntary sector, um, and to the National Deaf Children's Society for, for giving us some information on this today. But I think it is key to remember it's early identification, early diagnosis, early remedial action, and most importantly, early support uh, to give these children the best chance and the best start in life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I now call on the Health Minister, Robin Swan, uh, to respond, and the Minister is up to 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, first of all, can I thank the members for proposing this motion, which provides us with the valuable opportunity to consider the importance of early detection, intervention and support for children with hearing difficulties and deafness across Northern Ireland. And I echo many um, members' comments in regards to the tone and the that this debate has been brought forward on the contributions. I have listened closely to those members who have spoken in support of this motion, and I too support the motion. As Minister of Health, I understand fully the unprecedented impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on our health service as our collective and immediate focus. Quite reasonably centred um, our response on coronavirus, but as members have indicated, our, our tremendous health service and the people who work in it have remained steadfast in their work and ongoing efforts to maintain services where possible while still taking steps to fight the virus. For those children with hearing difficulties and deafness, I fully acknowledge the continued need for early detection, intervention and support. And I can advise members that the newborn born hear, hearing screening programme has continued to operate right throughout the pandemic. All those babies who failed their newborn Hearing screening have had their diagnostic auditory brainstem response testing completed within the four week target. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is a specialist test to provide a more detailed assessment of a baby's ability to hear, and the service has completed 134 such tests since the 1st of April. Within paediatric audiology, those children classed as clinically urgent are still being assessed within the 10 weeks of referral. There have been around 200 hearing tests undertaken for children classed as urgent, alongside 100 virtual assessments and reviews of children who regularly use hearing aids. Routine appointments within paediatric audiology, like many other specialities at this time, have experienced delays. However, every effort continues to be made to address this matter through the use of remote appointments or face-to-face -face appointments where a remote appointment is not appropriate. The COVID-19 pandemic has unfortunately resulted in some appointments being postponed due to the need to ensure the safety of patients and staff alike in these most challenging of times. The Belfast Health and Social Care Trust Paediatric Audiolo Audiology Service and the Paediatric Auditory Implant Service, which is responsible for cochlear implants, have continued to deliver services to children classed as clinically urgent since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. The services provided are delivered in line with national professional guidance and public health guidance on the safe and appropriate delivery of services during the pandemic. Um, as has been indicated, many of these consultations have been completed virtually where possible, with safe processes put in place to maintain social distancing, including the appropriate use of PPE for any child who requires a face-to-face -face assessment. An extended working day and six-day working are examples of the service being flexible and open to change to address the backlog that is developing. Those children with auditory implants are able to avail of technology, so their devices should be programmed remotely to help ensure their continuing development and hearing potential is maximised. For anyone whose child has issues or problems with their auditory implants, they are able to contact the service directly and they will be managed appropriately without delay. So if the mover of the motion has specific uh, examples or wants to make my office or my department aware of any specific cases, I'd be more than happy to follow those up. Because I can advise members um, that I am, I, I am informed there are no children awaiting a fitting of a hearing aid. Any child using a hearing aid who has an issue or problem is also assessed and managed appropriately without delay. It is the case that there have been some cancellations and rebooking of patients as the service reacts to the impact of staffing levels, risk assessments and bed and clinical avail availability during the pandemic. This is likely con to continue, but our health service will continue to deliver services to those children who require urgent assessment and treatment. The service is delivered by a small cohort of specialist audiologists and clinical scientists. Therefore, any staff absence impacts directly on the ability of the service to provide assurance in respect of an indicative time frame 
for managing clinical and routine patients, as well as the case before the onset of the pandemic. Mr Deputy Speaker, while the Health Service is doing its level best to maintain paediatric audiology services during the pandemic, I am clear that more needs to be done in tackling waiting lists. I have already referred to the use of virtual assessments where patients can be seen in triage. These new ways of working will have to be with us going forward as we continue to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. I am committed to reducing waiting times for these specialist services and providing the virtual early intervention to ensure that children with hearing difficulties can benefit from the excellent support our health professionals can provide. Services will require non-recurrent investment to bring waiting lists back to an acceptable level. This, however, will be in the medium term rather than the short term, as the main difficulties are due to staffing and the capacity of facilities during the pandemic, which is not expected to change over the next six months. Mr. Speaker, members will also, Deputy Speaker will also be aware that my department, the Health and Social Care Board, and the National Deaf Children's Society have worked collaboratively to draft quality standards for paediatric audi audiology services for Nor Northern Ireland, and we expect these to be adopted and published later this year. The Regional Audiology Forum, acting as the steering group and working with stakeholders and user representatives, has now completed this work and produced the draft paediatric audiology quality standards. The standards currently are going through the final approval, pr approval process. These standards will enable the quality of the service to be evaluated and benchmarked to identify target areas for service improvement focus. This will be particularly welcome in these very challenging times. Mr Deputy Speaker, in supporting this motion, I thank all members who have made contributions. It remains vital that we address the needs of those children with hearing difficulties and deafness in a timely way. And I would like to thank all of the professionals working in our paediatric audi audiology service, paediatric auditory implant service, and our health and social care trusts who continue to work tireless, tirelessly in these unprecedented times. Thank you. Next year, I'm Sir Pat Sheehan on Conclude a Correlation East Brock. And I call Pat Sheehan to conclude on the debate. Kerma, I've got to ask Ken Corla. Uh, could you confirm if I have five or ten minutes? Uh, ten minutes. Kerma, I've got. I'll start with the Lord Chancellor of East Brock. The show and you, I was by them. We've worked as a goal at Ahandana of the Lord Chancellor and you. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate today, and I thank everyone who contributed. I'd like especially to thank the Minister for his response and for coming along here today to listen to the debate. And uh, I want to welcome his acknowledgement that uh, more needs to be done to tackle the waiting lists, and particularly in, in these specialist uh, areas. Uh, as has been noted, uh, there's agreement and consensus right across this chamber today uh, in relation to this debate and the issue involved. And un unfortunately, that won't get a lot of column inches tomorrow, and there won't be any sensationalist radio shows on, uh, you know, congratulating us on agreement in, in the chamber. But that's life, I suppose, and, and, and we just have to deal with this. And I, I suppose I was on a, a Zoom meeting this morning, uh, and I suppose most of us experienced difficulties in this building with the Wi-Fi. I was using my laptop, and the, the signal kept dropping in and out, and you're picking up bits, and there, there, there's background noise and everything. And it was well, it was sort of half preparing for this debate, and I was thinking, that's, that's the experience of people with hearing difficulties. They don't hear everything. Background noise interferes, uh, and they, they, they experience those difficulties on a day and daily basis. And I was away a few years ago with a crowd of lads for a weekend at a match or something. Uh, and then, as usual on those occasions, uh, there was a bit too much alcohol consumed, uh, and, and the company was loud and a bit raucous at times. And I noticed one of the lads who's usually the life and soul of the party was sitting in the background. Uh, and he seemed down in the mouth for some reason. And I, I went to speak to him, and he explained to me that he had been having hearing difficulties uh, and was waiting on a new hearing aid. Uh, but with all the noise, he couldn't, he couldn't engage, he couldn't communicate, he couldn't hear 
what was going on. And, and, and I just thought for a lad who's always so happy-go-lucky, he was so demoralized. Uh, and, and imagine that situation for people who uh, have hearing loss and don't get treated. And Colin made the point earlier about making sure that people with hearing difficulties are treated with dignity. And the way to do that is to ensure that there is early intervention. And, and practically everyone involved in this debate talked about early intervention, because the earlier you intervene, the better the outcomes. And of course, uh, we, we, in the overall scheme of things, uh, some people may not think this debate very important. You know, when we're in here debating big ticket issues like, like Brexit and global pandemics uh, and so on, this may seem, uh, uh, you know, very small beer in, in comparison. But we have to think of the implications of this. And it has already been mentioned about educational underattainment among young people with, with hearing difficulties. And what's the upshot of that? And I mean, I know, and any of you have ever been involved in the Education Committee will know, that when children fall behind in school, for whatever reason, it's often very difficult for them to catch up again. And what happens then, they continue to fall, fall behind they end up leaving school uh, with uh, no educational qualifications. What's the upshot of that? Uh, people end up uh, more likely to become involved in the criminal justice system, more likely to have chronic ill health, more likely to suffer from mental ill health. Uh, and, and that was one of the points that Robbie made uh, about the isolation and loneliness. And I think of my friend and a crowd of, of 10 or 15 other fellas, you know, sitting outside the company, not able to participate, not able to communicate, that sense of, of isolation and, 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 uh, and loneliness. And in, in a sense, that's like a, a microcosm of the, this whole issue of hearing difficulty and deafness that we have to deal with. Uh, so, uh, the ramifications of hearing difficulties uh, and deafness are much more profound than just a few kids. Uh, you know, oh, 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 tough luck, they couldn't, they couldn't get it. They couldn't get their hearing test. They couldn't get their implant. It's much more profound like that. And I, and I think when we're dealing with issues like this, uh, all of us should be thinking about not somebody else's kids, but our own kids. How would we feel? if our own children had hearing difficulties and couldn't get the early intervention uh, and treatment that they need, deserve, and are entitled to. And I, I take on board the point that Alan made. Uh, the minister came in to his job with, with all the good intentions of the world, and COVID-19 has put paid to a lot of those uh, issues. And I don't, want, I don't want to raise a, a discordant note, and, and I, I know the minister mentioned it when he was speaking, that uh, the, the, the reason why a lot of these uh, consultations and treatments can't take place is to ensure safety of patients and staff and so on. But for the ordinary lay person, uh, the ordinary lay person will wonder why a particular service such as this, which is carried out by audiologists who are technicians essentially, uh, and that's my understanding, if I'm wrong, I stand corrected on that. There's no aerosol generating procedures involved, as far as I'm aware. I mean, I'm old enough to remember back when I was at primary school, uh, we used to get hearing tests on a regular basis. You put on a set of headphones and uh, a noise came through and you tapped the table with a pencil. Apparently now uh, it's advanced. You press a button instead of tapping the table. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I make lighthearted comment about that. But the serious point is ordinary people don't understand why some of these tests have been cancelled. Because it's not as if the audiologists are being dragged into the front line to deal with COVID. Uh, and I'm sorry I didn't uh, get the chance to ask the minister that before he spoke, 
but it's, it's, it's a question I'm putting out there. So um, I know I haven't mentioned a lot of people. Everybody uh, who spoke, I think, mentioned the uh, underachievement in education and, and mentioned the issues about uh, mental ill health. Uh, uh, I think it was Colm who mentioned the fact that last week was dementia week. And also, in older people, uh, there is a suggestion that dementia uh, or loss of hearing is a factor uh, in dementia as well. So all of these issues make this a, a much more serious issue than it would appear on the face of it. So again, I want to thank everybody for contributing to this debate and thank the Minister for coming along. Carmela Mayogov. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it and the motion is passed. Thank you. And if members just take their ease now while the Speaker resumes his place here.